Let's watch some vile gameplay instead because Crackety is on the Chinese. Woohoo! Could he do it? Could he finally do it? Because so far he's not been unable to. Crackety's been here before. I believe we watched him whip out the Chinese against the Muslim. We watched him whip them out against Beastie. Spoiler alert, didn't end too well for him. Maybe here he can finally do it. Maybe on a map where you could, uh, I don't know, Russia Barbican. He could do it. Let's find out if that's what he wants to do. Because we've watched Crackety actually play up against the Malians before. I believe it was Crackety up against the Muslim on Dry Arabia, where he'd done exactly that. He rushed, dropped a Barbican on the gold vein, and tried to deprive the Malians of what makes that. them a powerful Sith, their passive gold generation, which, of course, later leads into their passive food generation. Looking at this map, it's definitely something you could target out. You could start off by blocking off the initial pit mine and then wrapping around the south side. And if you recall, for anyone who watched that game, between Kraken and the Muslim, that was a big issue for him is that he didn't find the backup gold vein and block it out. He thought he'd got everything. And that's what allowed the Malian player to get back into the game. And the cool thing actually about going for this early Barbican drop on the gold, you can just stay here and take the gold afterwards. And the cool thing on top of that is that when you think about the Malians compared to other sieves, like other sieves will have a, a mining camp out here, 50 wood. And that's it. 50 wood. You push the, the gold workers away, but you burn 50 wood. Doesn't feel like it's worth it to drop a barbican. The comparative, though, for the Marlians, they just built this pit mine, and on top of that, pay 25 wood per house around it. So not only do you get more resource in exchange for a barbican drop here, you're also having a secondary element to that. You're blocking out the production rates because Linok has just invested all of his wood into houses here, except for, of course, the lumber camp. And then once you get rid of them, he has to get an extra 100 wood together that he quickly needs to invest into more buildings. Otherwise, he's going to be pop-capped. So we'll see if Crackety goes to that play. I, I do think it makes a lot of sense. Usually, it's nicer if there's like a close-by deer stack as well, so you have flexibility in what you do with the villages that you bring forward to gather. Because typically, you're going to bring, what, maybe like six to eight villages for a barbican drop. You don't want six to eight people working on a gold vein. It's just not a, a good investment at this stage in the game because you need so much food and possibly wood in comparison. Still, maybe we're jumping the gun. Maybe Crackety wants to go a different way. Imperial Academy could also be desirable with this layout of the base. You could probably cover most of your drop-off buildings and get a lot of gold. But your gold just realistically wouldn't compare to the Malians. You have to remember these guys, by default, as you can see, they get 30 gold. And then for each house or mining camp, an extra 25% gets added onto that, um, which... Gets pretty healthy, right? So he's getting, I think it's 58 gold per minute total here. It's been rounded up to 60 on this UI, but he's getting 58. Don't ask me why it's rounded up to 60. He's going to be going with the Monster Quarry. So even more passive gold coming out. Remember, this is the one that allows you to either gather 75 gold per minute or 75 stone. And you can toggle back and forth between. And looks like Crackety isn't going to be going for the rush this time. No, instead, he just stays at home and builds the Imperial Academy. Maybe a, a more respectable choice here. So the Barbican is tempting, but I guess I should should maybe explore the other side and explain why it can be a bad idea. This map is big. This map is big. And you'd be making that play without Wheelbarrow. I think that's always been one of the, the awkward details for the Chinese players is you know, Barbicans that are dropped in your opponent's base, they take so long to set up. You have to feel like you're getting enough out of it. And it feels like Crackety's approach to this is he looks, he sees the Marlins going to be getting gold. Sure. But the sacrifice of all that idle time of villages, followed up by the fact they're stuck in a gold vein and nothing else is nearby, uh, versus just investing in eco, it seems like in his eyes, it comes out better to go for the Imperial Academy. I agree, especially with this type of generation. We, we mentioned that he'd be able to get the wood line as well as everything else included. He'll be able to do exactly that. Other cool detail for him to consider is, like, while this initial gold vein will always be great for Lenox, going to give him a, a decent amount of gold, cheddar in the bank, whatever have you, the rest of the gold veins are, are pretty vulnerable. So in the mid-game, you can still fight the Marlin player over these before he starts to compound that passive gold effect going up to two free pit mines all bringing him passive income. And we are going to see the Barbican Park at home. So we'll secure his resources. Looks like Crackety intends to go for a secondary TC play. So free TC effective with the Song Dynasty. Not really much that Lee Knock is likely to do stop this early on. 
In fact, looking at the way he's set up, it's almost like he doesn't want to build military. This could actually be a Castlage rush out of Lenok. I don't think that Crackley's going to Castlage rush. We've seen him do that sometimes. He's actually a, a big fan of the idea of the Palace Guard rush when you can get around like a seven and a half to eight minute Castlage time for the Chinese. But considering he stopped off for Song, I think this is going to be a slightly prolonged feudal for the Chinese. Fat Lee is doing a good job at least keeping an eyeball on what's coming. And this should enable him to just go for this this free opening. Very hard on the stone, so it looks like we might be getting multi-TC play out of the Malians here. Quite intriguing, actually. They don't necessarily have anything in their repertoire that makes it desirable play, other than being able to toggle for stone generation with the Mansa Quarry. Um, but if you're giving this game where your opponent is going to TC boom, but you as the other player don't feel like you can shut it down quick enough, this is the next best option for Lenok. If he doesn't feel like he can build the military comp that would break this base, you might as well try to catch up with town centers of your own. And the cool thing is, although you know you need two TCs compared to Crackley now only needing one extra, if you think about the, the prolonged maths of this, like, sure, you need to invest in an additional TC. An additional TC would be 750 resources. By comparison, Crackety spent 600 resources on this Barbican to get to his free TC state once he builds a secondary. So you're actually not as far behind as you'd think. Now, of course, the Chinese are a little bit more efficient about this with the taxations, with the supervised. They're able to get an extra 20% on drop-off. But you as the Malian player have got your own perks and we've already seen that really come into power here. Lenok has one person on gold, yet he's generating 182 gold per minute. And soon more to come. Because it looks like he's set up a second pit mine. That's the other reason why he's now going for this TC, by the way. So the Malians have this natural transition point where they will go into these bad boys, the cows, whoop, whoop. Um, but the way they typically do this is they go passive gold into passive food. And then they're covered on two of the four resources. It's pretty incredible the way this, this sieve can function by Castle Age. But what Linok has realized is to get towards the passive gold state, a number he's happy with, he needs more wood. So he's actively going to invest into wood gathering with this town center. And that's then going to pay back in his ability to go out and build in all these pit mines early on. Pretty cool play. And another cool play is this choice to go cattles. He's going to run out of food fast. This is a map that is merciless when it comes to food sources early on. You have to come out beyond your initial holdings. Um, interesting thing, though, is that he's built the ranches. I would have actually been a very big fan of Lenop not just going for passive food. I hope he's going to save one or two of these cows because I think he will run out of food very quickly here. And you don't want to be on berries if you can just pay 100 gold to get 500 food instead. That I believe gathers at the rate of a deer, if I'm not mistaken. I actually kind of wonder if we're going to start seeing banker repairs come into play for the Malians. I've never really thought about this tech much. But buildings being repaired 100% faster is pretty nutty. Especially for walling. Not as much for keeps because the stone requirement, right? Like you don't get that much, you can't get that much passive stone. But for like securing, for, for actually holding onto walls is pretty damn effective. Even palisade walls can last a very long time because of that. Anyway. Let's focus on what is actually happening in this game. Looks like Lenok is prepping for the perfect landmark drop to boost up these cattle gathering rates. Uh, remember, each of these ranches, e with each cattle, it gives 28, goal, uh, 28 food rather per minute. Passively. Now, the cool thing is that when you get the landmark, when you get your tier 3 landmark, you can increase that by 20 per cattle. It's pretty strong. Actually, I think it's 20 per ranch, but it's still really, really good. Um, and he's kind of just casually getting to that stage. Meanwhile, on the other side, it looks like Crackety, he is investing now. He's going to new. Now, I wondered if he would do this or if he would just try to reach Castle, but I guess in his eyes, waiting too long is a weakness. However, this is a, a pretty big gamble considering what you're up against. Um, one of the things about Chigenu, like they are incredibly brutal in most matchups in Feudal Age. Anything lightly armored, they destroy, except for one specific unit that beats it in small and large numbers. It's the Javelin Throwers. Javelin Throwers, which are, remember, an anti-range specialist unit comparable to, I think it's the Peltist from AoE2. Um, but they also have more range than the Chigenu. So the Chigenu not only take bonus damage, but they can't 
trade because the javelin's always out of range. And you can already now see that's the identification out of Linok. He says, okay, if all you're going to do is mass the Chuganu, I'm going to build a small group of javelin throwers that, yep, they're pretty pricey, 120 resources each, but they will just destroy your range battalion. Skirmishes. Yeah, sorry, I got mixed up Peltas. Cracked easily. He's going to milk the cows while the moon is an out here. This is going to go into multiple rams to try and get through the infrastructure before the counters come out. You can see Lenok is now starting to prep the warrior scouts. Remember, this is something unique for the Malians. These boys are pretty brutal. Seven damage base, and then of course they do more damage against the siege. Respectable answer to rams. The one he has to be careful with due to the fact that they are zero ranged armor units up against Chuge Numas. Looks like he's knocking on the pit mine now. Like this choice actually by Lenok. He's going to go after the reinforcements. This is something that Crackley doesn't have an answer to, which is why you're going to see him peel back with the Chuganu. Now he's going to have to wait to send them in in groups of seven to eight. Meanwhile, the Warrior Scout mass is still going to keep building, and the Javelin counter is also going to be prepped and ready to go soon. Crackety. Looks like he was starting to save up towards Castle Age here. I think it might be his best choice. If he doubles down on this Feudal Force, I think he's eventually going to lose. J what? what uh, Lee Nock? That was a misclick and a half. Yeah, these units should not be in range like that. You may be noticing they have six tower range compared to uh, a mere 4.5. That was just an outright misclick. Bit of a whoopsie daisy one there from Lenok. This didn't lose all of the javelins, but as a result, has lost his pit mine entirely. Now, luckily for Lee, he did set up behind this. He's setting up a secondary one in the corner. So he's not going to run out of passive gold anytime soon, which is important because he needs the javelin for us. The Rams are still available for Crackety in the meantime, but Lenok is going to now start to escalate that Warrior Scout count. Crackety is going all in on this, though, and that, now I like it. We are up to 40 Chuge Nu in total. And Lenok doesn't seem to have any massive troops coming. In fact, Lenok, one of his cardinal sins here is it feels like there's just not enough food coming in. Especially when he wants to go for this many scouts. Remember the scouts, they cost 90 food each. So can add up quickly. And it is a lightly armored unit against Chuge Nubal. The only thing you have to count the Chuge Nubal right now are the javelin throwers. Rams are going to move into the archery range. That's going to force the pull of villagers here. And you'll see a commitment now from Kraken. He dives straight towards that villager force and will shred right through them. And this commitment, this is a game winning play. Look at all the villagers dying here. Rams will go down, but what was the price? I mean, Lenok just lost everything. Look at the eco situation now, being doubled up. Javelin throws up, still being addressed by the Chuge Nu to a reasonable extent. Now, of course, there is a lot of ranged armor on these units, but whoopty freaking doodah. You got Chuge Nu. Your damage can only be reduced to one at a minimum. Rams in the meantime are going to get through extra infrastructure. Second layer is coming in. And even if Crackley now loses this military force, what matters is that Lenok is crippled economically. Nine idle villages, half the eco count, nowhere near being able to compete. And we have to remember that back at the start of the game, we said if Lenok wanted to compare to what Crackley was doing, he needed a lot of passive income or he needed three TCs. He's two TCs. He's lost one of his passive income sources. The second one... While it is good, I mean, it's not comparing. It's really not comparing to what Crackety's doing here. Especially now with the farms being set up. And Crackety has two choices. He either doubles down on military now or he goes Castle Age. Either option is incredibly effective here. I've got a feeling he might be uh, just trying to end this in feudal. We're seeing horsemen being mixed in now as well. I'm actually a really big fan of him just going for Castle, though. Like, he's floating 1.5k gold at this stage. I'm not sure Crackney realizes just how much gold he's actually got. It's very easy to get sucked into the moment, be looking at other things, and just not notice that you've had way too many people on gold. We're definitely at that stage, though. I'd definitely like to see him drop a marketplace to adjust for that. Yeah, it looks like he did, but... Trying to buy the gold is uh, buy the food with the gold rather is not cheap. 
all these rams. And Crackley just has so much bloody wood to work with. It's a very dangerous game Crackley's now playing. Instead of teching up and moving away from wood source units, he's kind of doubling down on that element. You know, mixing in the horsemen now, building more of the rams, the Chige Nu. He's running out of wood fast. And if you remember, Gorge is not a map that has favorable wood spawns. Not initially, anyway. You have to get into the mid map, and that's where things can get dangerous. Especially if Lenox starts going in to these bad boys. The sofas are out in force. Okay, force may be a stretch. There's only three of them, but they're pretty feisty units. Especially considering that Crackley never did get textiles. About to be punished for exactly that. March in. And remember these sofas, they move quite fast. 1.73 movement speed. So they can club down a few villages on the retreat. Nice optimization there, Lee going off to different villages to make sure they don't scramble over each other. They're still blocking out some of the food that Crackley needs. Crackley, however, in the meantime, is getting close to critical mass here. Horsemen count close to 20. Chuge knew about the same. And in terms of defense force, Lenok really doesn't have much. Uh, he's switching into Donzos. And remember, Donzos are actually better in melee battle compared to normal spears. Not against ranged. He's only got one ranged armor here. These Chige Nu are going to be doing a hell of a lot of damage. In fact, they're going to be doing 12 each. And sure, the Donzos have more health, right? They're 100 health HP unit compared to 90 HP units at this point. But they're not going to last long. And the concern there is there's just so many horsemen and so few Donzos that Krakadi can essentially just A-click on the army and not care about whether he's taking the efficient fight. Donzos, <laughs> everything, including the javelins at one of these horsemen. We'll push them back. Third ram has been constructed, though. Krakadi is showing a lot of respect here, backing away. Not willing to go in just yet. Even though he easily could. In fact, Krakadi needs to be careful of the way he's retreating. He's grouped with the Rams. Okay, he finally realizes, but that cost him a lot more health than it needed to. Team to back away and Sofas. Learn the hard way that Shuge News do sting. Look at that clash now. Baying him in. Javelins trading out, but the horsemen get round the backside, and all of a sudden, Lenok finds himself in too deep here. Tech up comes through. It is a new age, a new beginning for the Chinese, just as the Malians come to an end. With no standing army and now an entire age behind, this game is Crackies for the taking. Whew. Good lordy. What a fight. The patience comes out from Crackly as well. He waits for so long. He sacrifices several horsemen. He wants his opponent away from his base because the moment that happens is the moment that he can wrap around and force Lenok to commit to the fight. And that commitment killed him. Lenok is now struggling. He's going to try to go for the tech up. Finally getting to the Grand Fulani Corral which of course you can see is going to get nearby cattle every an extra 20 food per minute, which will boost his food income to an absurd level. But you have to question mark whether that absurd level is any match for the Chinese economy at this stage. Crackity is close to being double the eco still. And in terms of army value, he's doubling up there as well. And remember, with the tech up already in place for him, the veterancy is already there. Horsemen need to be juiced up, but the Juge Nu have the extra damage. And the problem that you now have with your Lenok is once that tech up begins, or is rather complete, uh, the tech is only going to start researching, and that's going to take you another 30 seconds. That 30 second window is what Crackley's looking to use now, and this timing could not be better if he wanted it to be. Ram's going to move in. Just the tech up comes out. This is where Crackley should double down. Moves forward with the army. Second wave is on its way in, and Ram's really not committing yet, which is a little bit surprising here. He just needs to get in and do the damage onto the military production before they can do anything. Lenok is going to keep backing up with Javelin Throwers. Premium units he can't afford to expend. Horseman ready to just Zerg on top of them. The garrison comes out and the Rams will now move forward. And this, this is the moment Crackety was looking for. The moment where Lenok would break, would bow, where Crackety would finally get a win against one of the World Lord players. And he has done it here in the Gorge. Crackerty, Crackerty. He done it. He done it. My boy's in the chat. He done it. Good job, Crackerty. Always have faith in the Chinese. Finally. I, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to like count how many games it was, but it was a few, right? You got there, though. You done it. You took him down. Lee ain't that impressive, huh? You beat him. <laughs> 
I like how you actually adjusted. So for those that, that hadn't seen Cracky's previous uh, Mali and Chinese matchup, last time he tunnel visioned blocking the gold and missed the gold stack. Instead, he played to his advantage of Song Dynasty and multi TCs and just boomed ahead of the Malians. Chinese are still very free sieve to, to get wins on if your opponent doesn't want to do anything to you in the first 15 minutes. And glad that he saw that. Just really good plays. Good utilization of the Chuge Nu in a matchup where they should be bad. I think what Crackley done really well here is he just put his economy to work. Like Chuge Nu would usually lose this if you're on kind of even eco footing. But because the Malians are kind of playing from behind and being greedy, right? Like Lenok was not building any military infrastructure whatsoever. You're going to get away with what should be a, a bad matchup unit wise. Because Javelin Throwers, you saw the extra range they have, the extra damage. It's very difficult for Chuge Nu to fight that. But at that stage in the game, when you're that delayed getting into a military force and you're still playing Turtle in your base, you're forfeiting way too much over. Like, imagine this game if, for example, Lenok invested in a few sofas, he raided the flanks, and he stopped Crackety from getting onto the deer, onto the wood, onto these pocketed resources earlier on. If he forced the attention to the Chinese side of the map. It's possibly a different situation because the Chuge Nu can't mirror the movements of sofas. Because although Sofa slow, it sounds like it should be slow, it's quite fast compared to Chuge Nu. And at that stage, Horseman 